Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, glad to be here with uh, Karthik, my co-founder at, at Yugabyte. And here to talk about uh, building applications at cloud scale with data services. So just want to share an outline of the talk. We'll start with a really brief introduction. Then we'll look at how, uh, what changes are happening to the application tier and the data tier as applications are moving to a cloud native world. In particular, we'll focus on some of the challenges around the data tier and introduce Yugabyte DB, a high performance transactional database designed ground up for the cloud native era. I'll hand over to Karthik at that point for a, for a demo. We'll demo like an e-commerce application, uh, a modern app, you know, leveraging a cloud native architecture. And then he'll also do a deeper dive into Yugabyte DB's uh, architecture. We want to leave enough time for a Q&A at the end. So let's get started. Just a really brief introduction. Um, as Harry mentioned, uh, we started Yugabyte about two years ago, along with uh, Karthik and Mikhail. We led the NoSQL initiatives at, at Facebook. We were some of the early engineers that worked on Cassandra before Cassandra was even open source. Uh, led the team around HBase and, and put NoSQL, an HBase based NoSQL no platform in production for, for many massive mission critical applications at Facebook. To name a few, uh, Facebook's Messenger application uh, and Facebook's Operational Data Store, which is a time series database, they were some of the massive you know, uh, platforms handling you know, petabytes of data with uh, billions of uh, transactional um, operations per second, uh, per day. And uh, let's get right to the heart of the talk. So every, every industry, be it finance, retail, banking, it's right now you know, transforming to become, becoming a digital enterprise. And it wouldn't be a stretch to say that the apps are getting increasingly cloud native. Applications ultimately are at the center of you know, your customer engagement. It's at the heart of you know, retaining customers, uh, keeping cu customers sticky to your platform and enterprises you know, uh, staying relevant and ahead of their competition. So, so what is this cloud native paradigm, right? Let's let's think about the the key traits of of developing to a cloud native par paradigm. You can think of it as key traits or key requirements, and it comes down to a few key aspects. You know, enterprises want to want to ship products faster. They want to innovate rapidly. So agility is of utmost importance. The, the, the stack, the technology that you're using needs to be extremely developer and operational, operations friendly. Everything must be zero touch from operations to your continuous integration and delivery mechanisms. These apps must be architected for resilience. It goes without saying that you want to be able to tolerate different types of failures and still have highly available and online services be it a node failure, a, a failure of a data center or an entire region. These apps need global distribution. They are serving a global user base. They need global distribution for low latency uh, you know, serving requirements, but also for data protection. A third aspect is, is the very dynamic nature of these services. You want an infrastructure that can very scale up and down easily on demand with very low operational touch point. Uh, and, and to save costs, you only want to burst when you need to and, and shrink otherwise. So fundamentally, your entire infrastructure uh, needs to be designed to power your fast growing you know, needs of your online services. And last but not the least, your apps want, and uh, the enterprises want cloud ag agnostic or cloud neutral solutions. Your entire deployment uh, needs to be highly flexible. Enterprises are trying to avoid uh, being locked into particular cloud providers. They want to leverage their private cloud. They want to leverage all the flexibility of the public cloud and, and really deliver solutions that, that, that keep them you know, future-proof uh, in the face of the, you know, all the changes happening in uh, cloud providers. If one cloud vendor comes up with better networking or better inter-region connectivity, 
It should be very easy to port your applications to new infrastructure. So these are some of the common traits of a cloud native you know, paradigm of building and deploying applications. So, so what's, what's really happening in the application uh, tier here, right? So on the application tier, a lot of this uh, vision of a cloud native paradigm is coming to fruition right now. Uh, the data centers are moving from traditional, you know, one or two data centers uh, that corporates used to have to this plethora of, you know, data centers and regions that are available both in public cloud as well as in, uh, increasingly in private cloud too. The, the deployment infrastructure, uh, you know, for, uh, for efficiency reasons is going from bare metal deployments to initially to a VM-based environment and now more and more so to a container managed environment. Uh, and you know the public cloud providers are uh, bringing coming up with their own you know container management services and there are open source solutions based around containers and, and kubernetes all of these are bringing high amounts of efficiency uh, to app building and, and deployment and similarly at the application development or the higher levels of the application stack there's a move from you know legacy monolithic or proprietary application servers to open source frameworks around you know, Express, Spring, and, and Django that make your application building blocks uh, you know, much easier to, to uh, develop and, and roll out. However, in, in all of this, the, the database tier uh, still remains a huge challenge. The, the, what, what Kubernetes and containers uh, and, and the cloud native revolution has already sort of enabled at the application tier has not quite been materialized in the database tier of your infrastructure. And we'll see uh, you know, what the main challenges there are and what are the application requirements from a, from a data tier perspective. So traditional, traditionally, a lot of you are familiar with the traditional RDBMS architecture and, and the newer wave of, that's, that's been coming around for the last nine or 10 years around the NoSQL or scale out databases, right? And, but applications need features from both of these sides as, as they move to a cloud native uh, deployment model. Traditional databases like uh, you know, uh, RDBMSs were never designed for scale, elasticity, multi-data center deployments, uh, but their core strengths were around transactional guarantees, uh, very strong consistency. Things like secondary indexes, multi-table operations, you, know, you have asset guarantees around those building blocks that apps need. However, they suffer from the ability to scale to massive amounts of nodes, uh, have cross-region deployments, things like you know, expiring old data uh, using a TTL-like construct. So there are a lot of gaps in the traditional RDBMS offerings, and modern apps need, need, need uh, you know, components or, or features from both sides of the equation. So not having uh, you know, the best of these, the NoSQL and SQL in a single product, uh, what are the enterprises doing today to work around that? What does the typical you know, data stack look like today? And it comes down to uh, you know, something like this that we see multiple times. The application tier is often you know, running a microservices architecture. It's stateless. It's running in a containerized environment. But on the data tier, for some of your transactional needs, people are still using traditional RDBMSs. If the data set sizes increase what a single node can handle, then they deal with sharding of the, uh, of the data, and that's an application level problem. For their faster growing data needs, they often bring in a NoSQL database, be it Cassandra, MongoDB, or DynamoDB. And to deal with uh, you know, delivering uh, these apps at very low latency to applications, uh, often a third component such as a Redis or a Couchbase is added as a caching component into the mix. These graphs and uh, these lines and arrows are complex enough in a, in a single data center deployment. When you take a multi-data center deployment with each of these systems doing their own replication at their own uh, pace, and the app developer having to reason through the semantics of how do I keep my Redis cache consistent when I change the system of record data in the database, that's, that's a lot of fragile infrastructure and hand-holding and babysitting that needs to happen. So if you think about the agility and the deployment flexibility and portability that, that cloud native paradigm tries to bring forth, the more moving parts you have in that mess, in, uh, that much further away you are from realizing you know, uh, uh, that potential. And, and so you know, innovation slows down, you can't ship products faster, 
uh, in this complex architecture. And that's sort of at the crux of uh, uh, the simplification that, that we, are, we were trying to solve for when we started Yugabyte. When you think about this question from a different perspective, does, does the picture in the previous diagram really change when you move to public cloud, like say Amazon's AWS? Not really. Uh, most of the components in this picture still remain. Uh, Redis is offered as a managed service in AWS. Um, it, it's called Elastic Cache. You have traditional RDBMS available as a completely managed service uh, in the form of Aurora or, or, or RDS. And Amazon has a DynamoDB for you know, fast growing or uh, elastic uh, data requirements. But fundamentally, the app is still using multiple moving parts and dealing with logic to keep data consistent between these, these tiers. So it's still uh, the very same complex architecture. So that brings the question, so well, what are some of the enterprises, maybe some of the thought leaders in their respective uh, spaces doing about this? Often they have built together a custom data platform that, that brings, brings together three key elements. Transactional consistency, because your app developer doesn't want to deal with like you know, an inconsistent data tier. So there's transactional consistency, there's high performance, and global distribution and scale. If, if you had a data platform that kind of gave you these three building blocks, that frees up your app developers to focus on building apps. So you know, Facebook went through a similar journey. They built something called Tau. Uber has built something similar. Uh, Pinterest has built something similar. But the one difference is these were you know, package solutions good enough for internal consumption. Uh, the APIs might have been good enough just for the needs of Facebook application developers or Uber's application developers. But there's no general purpose platform that brings together a data tier platform that, that brings together these three key elements, global scale, performance, and transactional consistency. And uh, so our thought was there's got to be a simpler approach. And, and that's really uh, the genesis of Yugabyte, uh, uh, the database. Uh, and we went after these three aspects. Uh, Yugabyte is a transactional database that you know, has a document-based, strongly consistent storage engine. It offers both single shard transactions as well as multi-shard transactions, like if you need to update uh, 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 two tables that may be on you know, two different nodes of a very large cluster. Uh, Yugabyte DB enables those kind of operations. It's designed ground up for high performance, built in C++, designed for linear scalability. On the read path, it gives you various flavors of uh, consist consistency levels to have you know, a tunable uh, read paradigm in terms of uh, consistency guarantees. The writes are always you know, strongly consistent in, in its replication design. And finally, it's, it's designed to be deployed in a, in a multi-data center environment with automatic sharding, uh, rebalancing, adding nodes into a Yugabyte uh, database is, is you know, very low touch, low friction operation. But it's, 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 it's one of the core tenets though is it's built for the container era. Yugabyte DB runs just fine on bare metal VMs or containers and it can be managed by uh, you know, a Kubernetes, uh, in, a, in a Kubernetes environment with auto scaling and, and, and rebalancing. And last but not the least, uh, it's, it's open in two ways. Uh, the database is an Apache 2.0 open source uh, database, and the APIs are open as well. And so we'll, we'll talk about the APIs in, in just uh, a minute. So let me get to uh, sort of the overall Yugabyte solution. Fundamentally, uh, Yugabyte database has a common core or a common kernel uh, that, that has a you know, transactionally consistent, strong uh, or strong consistent replication underpinning. It has a log structured storage engine that's based on RocksDB, and it uses Raft, a distributed consensus protocol for, for replication. And this common kernel, which offers automatic sharding, elasticity, and load balancing, powers three popular APIs, bringing the best of NoSQL and SQL in a single database engine. And that, that's sort of a unique aspect of how Yugabyte has been architected. And those three APIs that we offer today are you know, a Cassandra compatible API. We've started with uh, Cassandra as a, as a base and already extended it with uh, things like uh, strongly consistent uh, indexes, uh, JSON data type. 
Uh, a second offering is Redis. Yugabyte offers Redis as an elastic persistent database, again powered by the same kernel. And, and the third is, uh, which is somewhat earlier uh, in, uh, in development uh, in Yugabyte, is a fully uh, an ANSI SQL compliant uh, offering on the same elastic kernel. So we are going with the Postgres flavored uh, SQL offering on top of Yugabyte. So in a nutshell, bringing NoSQL and SQL APIs in a brand new database engine powered by a common kernel that's strongly consistent and, and designed for scale and performance. Um, it's platform neutral, can run in public clouds, on bare metal, or in a containerized environment. And by going with open APIs, we get the benefit of some of the popular, ecosystem, popular and mature ecosystems around these APIs. For example, uh, you know, Spring applications that can talk to Redis or Cassandra using the Spring data connectors can just be pointed to uh, Yugabyte and they work off the bat because we are wire protocol compatible uh, with these, these layers. Uh, things like um, Smack stack, like your Spark connectors, uh, Cassandra-based connectors that Spark has to do machine learning or analytics or work on top of Yugabyte uh, as just some of the examples here. So with that, let me hand over to Karthik for a, for a demo and then an architectural deep dive. We're just going to switch laptops here for a little. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kanan. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the demo, but before we like quite switch into the, the demo, just wanted to tell you guys about what we're looking at. Uh, the first is like a real world example of building a real e-commerce application. It's built on the Yearn stack, so it's Yugabyte, Express, and uh, Node.js for the REST API layer, and uh, React as the UI. So React, Express, and Node.js, and a database is a pretty popular stack, and all of this is deployed use on containers using Kubernetes as the orchestration engine. Uh, what, what does that allow? That allows you to really quickly scale up, scale down, and run it on any cloud, on-premise, et cetera, right? So we're gonna take a look at that. Um, but as we are switching and taking a look at that, like it'd be good for you guys to just think about what like Kanan had presented in one of his earlier slides. Why cloud native? So some of the things that you want are feature agility. You want to be able to build your application really quickly. You want to be able to survive failures. You want to be able to scale out whenever you need. And you want to be able to run it anywhere. Like really, you don't want to build this on top of an AWS infrastructure and then, hey, you know what, it'll take me nine months to move this to Google because the, the next app needs to be run on Google for whatever reason. Or I need to use my on-premise data center elsewhere and I come back in one year because that's not going to happen anytime soon. All right, great. Uh, so what we have is a fully functioning Yugabyte database completely deployed inside containers and an app on top of that, like the, the e-commerce app, also inside containers. So first thing I'm going like, to sh sh show you folks, like, yeah, of course, connect to the machine. Um, yeah. What you notice is we have a three-way uh, replication factor three cluster, and we're going to look at the architecture of Yugabyte in a little bit, but we have two services that are that form the database itself we have a master service that is a background service that takes care of things like creating tables or coordinating upgrades of like schema across different nodes or so on and so forth so cluster wide operations and then we have a tablet server like nodes which actually do the io and we have a deployment like we have the stateless app which is running an express and uh, node core with react as the ui now uh, if I do a get services, this is exposed, the Yugabyte database is exposed to the external world using a load balancer service, and the app itself, called Yuga Store, which emulates a bookstore app, is exposed to the world using another load balancer service. So we're gonna go look at these two services to see how they actually look, okay? So this is a view of the database itself. Uh, what you notice is that on the right side of the screen, you notice that there are three pods, effectively containers or VMs or bare metal machines, whatever you have, three units of IaaS that talk to each other and form a strong replica group. They form a RAF replica, and those that is the master service. It's highly available. It's replicated using RAF, right? And it's, it keeps track of what's going on with your cluster. Now, what you also notice is that there are three tablet servers, which actually do the I.O., they host the data, they replicate the data, et cetera. 
uh, we can actually go in and, and this actually has some of the tables that we created for the app itself, which we're going to look at in a second. And the tablet servers here, uh, what this thing shows is that every table is really cut up into a small number of chunks called shards or tablets in Yugabyte. And each of the tablet servers hosts an equal number of tablets. Okay? So again, architecture deep dive, we'll look at all of this, but it's still like, good to explain it as we're seeing the app. Okay, so the app itself, what, is, what does the app do? So that's what the app looks like. Think of a standard online bookstore, right? It's a thing of the past. It's done, beaten to death. What's so interesting about it, right? But it turns out it's really hard to build this thing, run this thing, and scale this thing in the cloud, like even today, even in 2018, right? And, and why is that? So first off, what, can, what does the app do? It has a bunch of books. These books are categorized into some static categories. So you have books which are like your business books. You have some cookbooks. You have mystery and suspense books, sci-fi and fantasy, so on and so forth. And you have some dynamic categories. So you have books that have the highest rating of all books. So you want to sort them by the aggregate rating that people have given. You want books that have been most reviewed. So people have given reviews. You want to say like, hey, how many reviews has this book gotten? I only want to read books with high, uh, enough reviews. I don't want two people giving it five stars. And you actually have the books themselves which have a whole bunch of detailed information, right? So you have some information about what is the description of the book, what is the price of the book, so on and so forth, right? So how would you build this app if you were to think through this app? Well, it turns out, as a developer, if you think about the APIs, it is really natural to put the, the book information in some sort of an SQL-ISC table, but I should be able to add nodes and scale that out. We know SQL doesn't scale out. You can manually shard your databases or you can put replicas, but you cannot scale out your cluster. So if I keep getting like a million books, 10 million books, if I keep getting data, I wouldn't be able to scale it out. And the second thing I need to do is I need to take care of, static categories are easy. They don't change very often. You get a book, you tell, hey, it's a business book. It's not gonna really change into some other type of book pretty soon, so you're good there. But the dynamic categories, you really wanna say, Every time somebody gives a new star, you want to calculate a new aggregate very quickly, right? Well, it turns out you can either write a really complicated application to do that and store data in a bunch of places, or you can use something like Redis, which actually has, believe it or not, a data structure that encapsulates that. It's called a sorted set. All you have to do is put your data into a sorted set and Redis spits out the top K for you. It's really good for dynamic. But what's the catch, right? Everything comes with a catch. The catch is Redis doesn't store data. Redis doesn't shard data. So you can neither expand this without a lot of work, you have to do that yourself, nor can you like, protect it against failures. It's not resilient. So you need to go store this data elsewhere, and now you'd be splitting hairs about how to store that data, how to replicate it, how to reconcile this. Exactly the, the, the architectural picture that Kannan had showed. All right, so this is built on top of Yugabyte. And it uses the Cassandra and Redis APIs exactly as they are, but Yugabyte re-implements the data, these API layers on top of a stable core. So how do we do that? Well, first thing we do, we connect to the Cassandra shell in Yugabyte, which is just like another table inside the database. It's replicated, you can add nodes to, to scale out, it's, it's got consistency, it offers you protection against failures, and you'd be able to do like, hey, you know what, I wanna show three books any three books, just show me three books, right? So that sort of a thing gives you, hey, here are like three books. Now you say like, you know what, I wanna see three books in the business category. Well, that's easy enough to say, like you can just add a where clause and you can say like where category is business. And now you'll be able to see three business books, right? And now you can say, you know what, that's great and all that, but show me three business books that are hardcover, right? Like, and you'd be able to show them. So all of your static displays are taken care of pretty well by the Cassandra API provided by Yugabyte, but your dynamic displays right, are taken care of, and the Z rev range is like, give me the highest books by rating, give me the book IDs for those books, right? So, and it, it, or this is the, yeah, so this tells you that give me the top three or four books, zero to three, zero, one, two, three, so give me the top books by rating, by the aggregate rating, along with the book IDs. So that's what this query does. And similarly, it all, you can also say, give me the top books by the total number of reviews that book has gotten, and 
Unlike Redis, like the vanilla open source Redis that you would have used, this is also a strongly consistent, persistent, replicated database. So we've used two APIs, and we have built an application. We really didn't have to worry about synchronizing data between them and figuring out what is, what is missing from this side, what is missing from the other side, how do I bring them together, so on and so forth. Okay, and the best part is let's run a, a fake, like, the Bangladeshi click farm against this bookstore, right? So let's see exactly how this app works. So we have three nodes in there, and what you find now is that one of the, one of the, the read ops and the write ops column, they actually show that the data is actually sprayed across the different nodes, and you'd be able to add nodes and scale this system out very, very easily, okay? So I'm gonna switch back to the, oh, actually, so now let's say you wanted to go ahead and deploy this application in a globally distributed manner, right? So I'm gonna pull up our enterprise edition of, of Yugabyte. This allows you to get started with a public cloud really, really quickly. So you go to like the config tab and you say, you know what, I wanna configure, this is something that you run on your data center, you can configure it against Amazon, Google, Azure, on-prem, Kubernetes, whatever you have, right? So you configure it against all the pieces of IaaS simultaneously and then you'd be able to go ahead and place your data and create a cluster or a universe across any of the data centers in the world. So instead of creating one, we can just go take a look at a couple of deployments. So this deployment is a globally di distributed deployment which has data in US, e US West, US East, and in Tokyo. And you can simultaneously interact with the database using Cassandra, Redis, and Postgres, the third API that we're building. So, so what that means is you have your app, as a developer, you just talk to these APIs, you use the APIs because they make your life simpler, and you don't have to worry about how the data gets replicated and where you need to read it from, and, and so on and so forth. So this sort of a deployment, think of a user login password app, right? What this is doing is about 2,000 reads or user logins, and about 50 odd writes or change password. So that's a very simple way to think about what this app does. What you get is about 200, like on the, the red below, the select latency is around 200 microseconds, so very, very fast when you want to log in. The write latency is around, is a little under like 185 milliseconds, but it gives you global consistency, right? So it's one deployment. Um, another deployment is to use a read replica. In this example, we have reads and writes going on in the west coast, um, which is the one which looks like orange. And the thing on blue is a read replica, which only serves reads out of the East Coast. It so happens that the West Coast is running Google and the, on a Google Cloud, like Google Data Center, and the East Coast is running on an Amazon Data Center. And once again, you can interact with this deployment using Redis or Cassandra or Postgres, which will come up pretty soon. And what you find is we're doing around 30,000 reads and about 750, uh, 780 writes. And the latencies are low because your writes are all close by, right? They all go to a single multi-zone deployment or a multi-rack deployment. Uh, 1.7 milliseconds and 200 microseconds on the reads. So you'll be able to get all of these advanced deployments, but this is what the end user wants. They just want to interact with your app really quickly and maintain consistency, right? Like that's roughly, the, that's, doesn't look like too much to ask anyway. But, but so uh, going to switch over to the slides again, and we can look into the architecture of what we just saw. Okay, so what we saw, again, quick recap, we saw that we stored some data, which is the less dynamic data in the Cassandra side, and the more dynamic data in, on the Redis side, but we use them as APIs. They're both like fully functional tables, um, and we used appropriate APIs in order to extract the data. In, and we didn't have to worry about piecing together two databases in our, in our application, figuring out how to do cache invalidation or how to like populate the cache whenever the database changes or keep the data safe or when a node dies, how do I repopulate this guy? Or maybe there's async replication and some of the data, like the reviews, didn't get replicated, but the core data did and now I'm getting inconsistent data. So this is what app developers have to deal with. Okay, um, so again, if you think about what it enabled, you'll be able to build your app and your features with a lot more agility because it embraces the cloud native way. It's fault tolerant, irrespective of the API you use. 
It's got scalability. You don't have to worry about the cache and sharding the cache and figuring out the database and all of that separately. And it's cloud agnostic. You can deploy this anywhere. It's containerized, right? So, or bare metal or VM or what have you. OK, so with that, we'll go into the architecture. Now, it would be good to look at what we present in addition, additionally with the following lens. Like if you look at it from how does it enable app agility, like it'd be, it'll, it'll make a, an interesting discussion, right? So um, how do we enable multi-API with a common database core? How do we do fault tolerance across these different APIs, and like with automatic failover? And how do we do dynamic scalability, where you're able to add nodes because of its automatic sharding, again, across these APIs? So it'd be just good to keep these angles in mind while we're going through the architecture. And uh, some of the other goals that we set ourselves while starting out to build Yugabyte were to make it transactional. One of the common failings of NoSQL today is the fact that it's not transactional. You cannot update two keys atomically, you cannot get a consistent secondary indexes. These are very core requirements in order to build a wide array of applications. Uh, we wanted it to be highly performant because performance is a key concern in the cloud. It's one of the reasons people augment their deployments with a cache, and it's also the reason why apps get very complicated because you now have to deal with the cache, right? And uh, we made sure we didn't have any dependencies on external systems, like there are databases that depend on things like, like Zookeeper, for example, HBase does, and these get very hard to deploy when you go to a hybrid deployment or a multi-zone deployment or so on and so forth. And finally, um, we had to make it cloud native, so you should be able to do things like the cloud way. I wanna change my machine type, but I don't want to go and send a notice to all my users who I don't even know who they are to say it, the system's gonna be down for three hours. So, Yugabyte enables online change, so you can change your machine type, your geographies, you can add and remove zones, all of this stuff while your app is running with zero downtime. Okay, so how's all that done? At a high level, again, goals, we wanted to make sure that since it was transactional, in the CAP theorem, we like embrace, we are a CP database, so we are consistent and partition tolerant, but we are still able to provide HA, right? And, and people often say, is this violating the CAP theorem? It's really not because uh, like Google Spanner, we take a few seconds to re-elect a leader. So your availability is not a zero in the case of uh, a failure. The availability is reduced to a window of a few seconds, right? And, and typically apps can tolerate a few seconds of failure. It's only when the failure goes into minutes or multiple minutes that it really shows up as a downtime to the end user. Okay, process overview. Uh, a universe is a cluster in Yugabyte. Uh, we call it a universe because in advanced deployments where you have read replicas, you can actually have multiple clusters inside a universe. So you can have the primary cluster and you can have a whole bunch of read replicas. But the whole deployment is called a universe. Uh, us, and we're only gonna deal with a simple universe which has just the primary data. We're not gonna look at async replicas to keep things simple. There are two processes which effectively form their own distributed systems and become two services. The two processes that are deployed are the YB master and the YB T server or the tablet server. And uh, this is an example of a four node uh, cluster which replication factor three, right? And where you see that there are as many masters as the replication factor and there are as many tablet servers as there are nodes. Okay. Every time you create a table, Yugabyte automatically partitions the table. So the table is split, the key space, the entire key space of the infinity key space, right, is split into a number of shards or tablets, right? And what you find is every time you try to interact with the database, it hashes your value and puts it into some tablet, okay? That tablet owns that key and owns that piece of data. Now, Every time you add nodes, the tablets get rebalanced and therefore you're able to do automatic sharding which helps you grow and shrink as you need irrespective of the API you're using on top. Now, every tablet which owns a certain set of keys is replicated because there's a replication factor. And this is done by picking multiple nodes which have tablet servers running and asking those tablet servers to host a copy of the tablet. Each copy of the tablet is called a tablet peer, and they all enter a raft replica group, which does strongly consistent replication. Okay, the, the replication factor really controls how many members are there in these raft groups, 
And why do, why do we replicate data? It's simply to survive failures. So if you do a replication factor of three, you'll be able to survive one failure. Of five, you'll be able to survive two failures, seven, three failures, so on and so forth. Right? So it's simply a, a fraction of how much of downtime do you want to absorb. The next piece, so we talked about how each table is split. We talked about how each of these splits or tablets are replicated. So the next piece is how do you interact with them? You interact with, these, with this data through well-known languages, but we've taken a special care to make sure that we have a query layer which is pluggable, and it runs, it is a stateless pluggable query layer, and it runs on every node, basically as a part of the tablet server process. The query layer actually has query layer adapters for running Cassandra, Redis, and SQL, Postgres. And we can continue to add more and more access patterns because fundamentally the requirements under the hood are the same. So, I mean, our thought behind this was if, at least this is how I feel, if anybody told me to learn one more language, I'd probably go shoot them because there's so many databases already and like, you know, you can get stuff done with what's out there. But what is really important is what happens to the data underneath? That's great, I wrote the data, but is it replicated? Can I back it up? Can I read it from a remote data center? These are the requirements that are driving apps to do more and more complicated things, not so much the lack of APIs, right, into a database. Okay, the tablet server process is the process that does the I.O. It is in the critical path, so it is the one that handles all of your I.O. It hosts a whole bunch of tablets for across multiple tables, and each of these tablets or tablet peers that it hosts holds a copy of the data. Um, it also hosts the transaction manager. The transaction manager, as you might recall, gives, is responsible for giving you a global view of the table, a global consistent view of the table. If you're modifying two keys atomically in a transaction, you should either see both changed or neither changed. So the transaction manager tracks a whole bunch of stuff in order to enable that. Uh, finally, the tablet server takes care of a, a whole bunch of other concerns, re re mostly relating to resource usage and performance such as like automatically sizing your caches and your mem stores because you may have one table that's written to very frequently and another table that's being read from very frequently and they have completely different designs in terms of how the user interacts with them but they still need to be scaled out for efficiency purposes and the tablet server takes care of to do that like in a, in a natural way across different tables and tablets. Okay, the master, the second process we talked about, is a strictly background process. It is not involved in serving your I.O. Uh, it is, so therefore, it's not in the critical path. It keeps a lot of system metadata, like what are your key spaces, what are your tables, tablets, users, roles, permissions, so on and so forth. It also takes care of enforcing a lot of administrative operations, like if you create a table, what really happens under the hood is you need to create tablets across multiple, t multiple nodes or tablet servers, and you need to make sure that that has completed in a fail-safe way. So the master keeps track of that and a whole bunch of other background activities, right? Okay, so we talked about an overview, so now it's, it's gonna like go real quick. So we're gonna talk about persistence um, or DocDB. So the way we store data at the core like independent of the different API layers is a document model because we believe that serves a wide array of use cases. Uh, so DocDB is the LSM core inside Yugabyte. It's a heavily extended and modified version of RocksDB that offers a document view on top of the data. If you recall, RocksDB is a single node key to value store. DocDB makes that a key to document store. And if you put Raft on top of that, it is now a distributed key to document store. So that forms the core layer of Yugabyte, right? Um, okay, so it's, uh, DocDB is designed to support a lot of density per node. So, and like a lot of the HBase architecture where we, we've run like 48 terabytes of data density per node, and that was on, on spinning disk too. A lot of that architecture finds its way into DocDB, so it's, it's pretty optimal for running really, really massive workloads. And this is especially important in the cloud because storage is cheaper than compute in the cloud. So you want to actually pack as much as you can. If you have to add CPUs in order to store more data, your bill is gonna explode in the cloud, and people often say, hey, cloud's really expensive. It, it is, but you have to go the cloud native way and um, embrace it rather than just a lift and shift. Okay, so it, this uh, slide gives you an overview of how a document is stored inside DocDB. It allows for fine-grained control. 
So um, at a high level, there's a document which models a row, if it's CQL or SQL, and it models a data structure, if it's Redis. Uh, you have a document key. In the case of Cassandra or SQL, it forms the primary key of the table, so the whole bunch of columns that comprise the primary key. And in the case of Redis, it's actually the key that you use to read up data. And it allows you to do fine-grained updates, like upserts, updates, reads, and writes. So it allows you to do a whole bunch of fine-grained operations on top of this document. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of enhancements on top of RocksDB in order to get DocDB like highly performant and capable of handling a wide array of, of APIs. Like, firstly, we took out the uh, RocksDB is a single node data store. So we took out its write ahead log because we were using Raft as the replication log. So there was no need to double write ahead log it. So we took that out. But the minute you take out the write ahead log, you have to control. What the, how the MVCC looks, or the multi-version concurrency control, so that your updates don't, aren't read before they're committed. So we took that out, too, and integrated that into like uh, the layer above. So this ended up tying the raft log to, uh, to our docdb slash rocksdbs to make it a distributed consistent store with strong consistency. Uh, we've changed a whole bunch of uh, file formats. Again, a lot of experience based on running systems at scale in, in Facebook. It's an interesting story where once, uh, we got a complaint saying that you know uh, Mark Zuckerberg's email was like way too slow and like it's taking forever to load. And it turns out he had a ton, like uh, ton, tens of megabytes of indexes that had that got paged out. And it turns out he just became time man of the year. So, but whatever. But yeah. So the, at that point, we figured we had to shard the indexes. So a lot of that feature makes its way here. Um, and, and a whole bunch of other features, really, like uh, separating queues for compaction. So people keep complaining about in Cassandra, there's a P99, latencies are really too high, and we've gotten that under control, and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, even more RocksDB enhancements. So uh, how to make Bloom filters really efficient, even though they're paged uh, for the data model that it's modeling on top or how to make your block cache and mem store global across different RocksDB instances instead of each one, instead of you having to size each RocksDB independently, or a scan-resistant cache, which often comes up. People read a lot of old data, but sometimes, but read a lot of recent data all the time. OK. Um, whole bunch of uh, raft enhancements, too, in order to support our use cases. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all of this, but just going to show you the first guy, leader leases. NoSQL databases often do not talk about leader leases, but what is a leader lease, right? Let's say you have a replicated piece of data, x equals 10, and you have a partition. So the guy who's the current leader gets partitioned. Now, the client wants to make an update to the new leader, and it says x equals 20. Great, but the old guy is partitioned away, and he still thinks he's the leader, and he says x equals 10. The new guy's written x equals 20. And if the client is not partitioned from the first guy, but says, like, hey, what did I just write? What is x? He's going to get back 10, right? It's a problem. And it's a problem that most of the NoSQL databases do not address. And it's easy to explain away as eventual consistency. But it turns out this sort of a paradigm isn't good for building most applications, because, like, you change your password, you're able to log in with the old one. You change your name, it doesn't show up. You write a post, it just disappears. So it has all sorts of bad implications here. So the way we deal with this is we tell the old leader, you're the leader for a certain period of time in the future. As long as you can renew it, you can continue to be the leader. If you cannot renew it, you have to step down. Like You cannot serve rights as the leader anymore. You can serve it as a replica, but you cannot serve it as the leader. And so. The tablet server, too, becomes the leader, but he would not be able to take writes until the future time has expired on the first guy, on the original leader. So that means there is a window for which, even though tablet server 2 is the leader for tablet 2, he just doesn't take writes. He just waits. And these times are actually in the milliseconds or like few seconds, so it really isn't application visible, but it's extremely important in order to ensure consistency. OK, final deal, transactions. So Google Spanner popularized the fact that you, it is, in fact, possible to do transactions on a scale-out system. Uh, and they use atomic clocks in order to aid transactions to give a good like, latency, like to, do, uh, to get a good latency out of these transactions. Now, Yugabyte also 
implements distributed transactions, but there's a spin. Like, Yugabyte is very highly performant, yet it performs distributed transactions and, and doesn't necessarily need an atomic clock. So where's the catch? Like, looks like the laws of physics are being broken, but in reality, they're just being bent a little. So the way Yugabyte works, it seamlessly detects, are you doing a distributed transaction across multiple nodes, multiple keys, or are you doing a single shard transaction, which in fact actually hits keys inside a single shard or a single node. If it detects that you're doing a single shard transaction, it keeps your performance extremely high. So it's going to be in the, in the, low, in the microseconds to a few milliseconds style latency. If you're doing a distributed transaction, it's going to make sure that your latency is still very good as long as you don't hit conflicts. When you hit conflicts, that is two different transactions are trying to update an overlapped set of keys, then it tries to say, hey, you know what, something's going on here, I need to resolve correctness, at which point it falls to clock skew. With an external atomic clock, you get better performance. With NTP synchronization, you may not, you may get slightly higher latency, but we believe that's a small percentage of cases that really hits you. But the advantage of this, I mean, and, and yeah, it essentially says that, but the advantage of this is you can actually run high performance RDBMS style applications that need transactions, secondary indexes, unique constraints, so on and so forth on a scale out system. Right. Okay, last bit, uh, isolation levels. Uh, maybe not that popular a, a topic, but it's like uh, there's a bunch of isolation levels. There's maybe too many, in fact, some shouldn't even exist. Uh, we, we implement snapshot isolation currently, which we believe is essential, is the right level of isolation and gives you the maximum performance to implement secondary indexes and to detect write-write conflicts, which are like most common. Um, but serializable isolation level, which does read-write conflicts or read-read, like, uh, is something that we will work on and, and implement so as to give the whole range. But irrespective of either, the most important part is if you're doing a read-only transaction, it's lock-free and it's very fast. So, and that's typically what people want when they want consistency on writes, they want speed on the reads. You can try Yugabyte on your laptop, it's open source. You can like download it and try it. You can try it using like Docker or Kubernetes or just Mac OS or Linux and that should kind of tell you the talk is wrapping up. So, uh, so that's all I had. Happy to take questions if folks have any. Yeah. What are hardware requirements for this? How many nodes minimum I can have <laughs> to install it? And does it support like network drives, for filers? And where you store your data files? So I think first question is how many nodes I believe? Um, as min minimum as many nodes as the replication factor. Uh, I think second question was where do we store the files? We just use the local file system. We recommend XFS, but we can work with any file system. So it's just like a bunch of files on a disk drive that, that you configure. But I didn't get, an, you had a third question I didn't get, I think. Those are the two, okay, good, yeah. yeah I mean, if, uh, if you were asking if we support multiple disks per node, we do. And we balance the tablets across the disks provided, the transaction logs are balanced across the this typically for performance, you, we just recommend direct attached uh, disks and uh, like an XFS or EXT4 file system. So at the lowest level, it's like RocksDB, the stable files that live on these uh, drives. I have two questions. First is, what is your limitation on the scalability? If I want, for example, 5 million operations per second in my cluster, what is the limiting factor? Is that master nodes or what is the, the tablet server or what is the so uh, like it's, it's just the size of the cluster. If you keep adding nodes, you should be able to scale out, assuming that the schema is designed correctly and the reads are actually scaling out to all nodes. Like, uh, at a high, like if you keep hitting the same key, it's, it's gonna be tougher, right? So uh, like assuming those, the, the master is not in the hot path and the system scales linearly with number of nodes. So. We've, there's, we've, no single there's no single yes. bottleneck, yeah. yeah the, the Yugabyte master is more of a, uh, it, it does two things. It's like a background curator of the system that does some administrative tasks, uh, rebalancing background operations, like if, if a node has less load, it might send some additional load to it. It also keeps the system metadata, which tends to be in much smaller order of magnitude of data. But in the critical IO path, Yugabyte master is not involved. Typically all the metadata is cached all the way to the client drivers 
So they're often routing your request to the right, right nodes in the system and you get essentially linear scalability as you go. We've done tests up to like on a public cloud, one point, one point something million writes and 2.5 million reads. So we've scaled out to that. I mean, we just stopped after that because uh, expensive, <laughs> expensive yeah, cloud bill. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon's taking yeah. the money. So. <laughs> so the second question is uh, time series. What do you do with time series? Um, so fundamentally, like uh, you know, time series or applications that are processing a lot of event-like data, be it uh, uh, a location service uh, such as uh, a shipment tracking uh, product, right? That's that's getting pings from lots of trucks. So you have a lot of these classes of applications where there's a heavy amount of data ingest that comes in, and maybe some. Uh, aggregations need to happen and they may use something like Spark to do a little bit of localized aggregations to take that raw data and roll it up to an hourly or a uh, monthly interval. Uh, but ultimately this data needs to land in a, in a highly elastic you know, database that's a, that can be the serving tier that powers your applications, be it dashboards or you know, uh, customer uh, portals where a customer can log in and say where is a particular truck during the last six hours or a very specific query, right? So you need a database uh, that can address point queries very well, like specific records and look at the history of those, as well as be able to do uh, analytics on top using be it Spark or Presto. So at the core, uh, Yugabyte has, has been designed uh, it, it, with many optimizations to support these high volume use cases. Um, be it uh, you know how we do the storage engine with minimal write amplification, easily updating records into the storage engine without incurring a read modify write penalty. A lot of optimizations around retiring old data or like data that expires very cheaply. You can set table level or row level TTL to automatically expire data. So you may have an hourly table that just needs to purge older data that's after you know seven days, but but your monthly data maybe you want to keep forever. Uh, any other? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, again, based on a few use cases we currently have, like some of the other questions are like, can you read, for example, a year's worth of data? Like, can you extract that? But most of my customers are doing like a, a few hours worth of data. I don't want my large read to affect my, my long scan to affect my short scans. So we have a scan resistant cache in order to handle that use case. Uh, we allow you to have like, if you think of an RDBMS table where you have a primary key column, like let's say two primary key columns, the first one is a device ID and the second one is a time, the time column and then you have some payload. Uh, the Cassandra API, for example, allows you to say what key to partition it by and what order to sort the time by. So you could say partition it by the device ID, so keep all the data for a device on a single shard, but sort it in a descending fashion in time so I can both look up the most recent value very efficiently as well as do any arbitrary range in time efficiently, so we support all of those. Thanks. Yes, yeah. um, great talk, too. Good product. A um, couple Thank questions. You. Since you are file system agnostic, you said, do you then, can you be file system aware where you'll take advantage of the various hardware manufacturers' storage optimization or recovery methods? And then the second question is, what's your licensing model? Um, yeah, maybe the second one is easier, so we go with that one first. <laughs> but uh, we are open, open source. It's Apache V2 license, uh, at the open source portion. And on the enterprise edition, we license per node. So it's a per node or per core model. So um, we don't charge for the amount of storage. Like we're not, it's not the ingest or the data size. So, so, so that's that. Uh, and our open source, just wanted to say, like Apache V2 open source is fully functional. It's got a, a lot of great features. It by itself is a cutting edge database, right? So uh, to answer the, the second part, it is, it depends on the type of recovery. It is possible that we can uh, take advantage of a few of these things. Uh, for example, if you view Kubernetes as a vendor specific uh, you know, piece of software, Kubernetes does this thing where it brings up a pod with its disk even after the node fails on a different location. Uh, but it turns out that the pod has the same network identity when it comes up in the new location. So that is something that we can take advantage of. But I think in the more advanced cases, it, it really depends on, on those. It's, it's possible, but it depends. I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, uh, if, and sort of another slice of the uh, question perhaps was, today, today the, the way the rocks DB layer or the, our document DB interacts with the locally attached drives is through a file system API. Uh, and as uh, things like DIN based uh, storage comes uh, to life, 
uh, that may not be the most efficient way of interacting with that. And we'll definitely be uh, you know, yeah. wanting to look at NDMA. taking advantage of the byte addressable you know, storage model rather than necessarily taking a 4K write amplification even for a small transactional yeah. write. Uh, so uh, today, uh, to be honest, that's not sort of where our bottleneck is. Often to accept uh, and finalize a transaction, it is the network round trip. And often in a public cloud, uh, that becomes your main latency. If, if the, your three replicas are three availability zones in a data center, then that round trip is in the one to two millisecond range. Um, and if you're much further apart, like East Coast and West Coast, you're talking 70 millisecond range. Uh, so often just uh, scale, uh, simple elasticity, giving the basic programming uh, primitives to application developers, like bringing the best of NoSQL and SQL in a single product that's operator friendly. That's sort of like the first wave of uh, problems, if you will, we're focusing on. So we've not yet gone down the you know, extra optimizations at the storage way. All right, I think it's uh, one o'clock. I think uh, uh, we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank Kanan and Kartik one more time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for us. having us. Yeah. Yeah.